Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, to mark the 37th anniversary of the start of the nuclear meltdown at Three Mile Island in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, we take an in-depth look at the accident, my personal narrative, having been there and lived through it, plus how it impacted the physical and mental health of local residents, how TMI operator Metropolitan Edison lied to media and government, the failings of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to protect we the people and the environment, and to get a bird's-eye summary of the 37 years since it happened from Eric Epstein of Three Mile Island Alert. Also in this week's program, our former Nuclear Regulatory Commission Commissioner, Peter Bradford, nuclear engineer Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education, TMI-adjacent resident Mary Stamos, and archival audio from the mainstream media coverage back in 1979 when the terrifying nuclear accident was unfolding and the media was paying close, unfettered attention. Today is Monday, March 28, 2016, and here is the Nuclear Hot Seat Three Mile Island Anniversary Special for 2016. What we forget is the fear. In the wake of Fukushima, we in the movement for nuclear sanity and the media will often refer to the nuclear accident that took place at Three Mile Island, which happened on March 28, 1979. But we don't really discuss it or even consider it in any detail. There are undoubtedly listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat who weren't even born then and don't know much about this accident other than what they've heard so often from the media, the government, and the industry. It happened, nobody died, no big deal. And then, if this person is in a nuclear conversation, we'll move the discussion to the more obvious horrors of Chernobyl or Fukushima. But I cannot forget Three Mile Island, because I was there, literally one mile away, visiting an old friend who had recently moved to the area. The first day, I was ignorant of the accident because I was alone in my friend's house, doing some writing, and not listening to radio or television. By not paying attention to the media, I missed the initial warnings, which sounded like this. An accident in the water cooling system at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, forced the company to call a general emergency and shut down part of the plant for an unspecified period. Just two days later, Walter Cronkite, the most trusted newsman in America, started a special report on Three Mile Island on CBS like this. The world has never known a day quite like today. It faced the considerable uncertainties and dangers of the worst nuclear power plant accident of the atomic age. And the horror tonight is that it could get much worse. It is not an atomic explosion that is feared. The experts say that is impossible. But the specter was raised of perhaps the next most serious kind of nuclear catastrophe, a massive release of radioactivity. The Nuclear Regulator Regulatory Commission cited that possibility with an announcement that, while it is not likely the potential is there for the ultimate risk of a meltdown at the Three Mile Island atomic power plant outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. But by the time Cronkite's announcement hit the airwaves, much had happened that set the course for the accident, the bungled follow-up, and the trail of lies that followed. The nuclear accident at Three Mile Island began at 4 a.m. on Wednesday, March 28, 1979, with failures in the non-nuclear secondary system, followed by a stuck open valve, which allowed large amounts of nuclear reactor coolant to escape. The mechanical failures were compounded by the initial failure of plant operators to recognize the situation as a loss of coolant accident due to inadequate training and human factors. In particular, 
A hidden indicator light led to an operator manually overriding the automatic emergency cooling system of the reactor because the operator mistakenly believed that there was too much coolant water present in the reactor and causing the steam pressure release. Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education and a familiar supportive presence to the anti-nuclear movement was a nuclear industry insider at the time of Three Mile Island. He has since come to be one of the world experts in exactly what took place. The big questions he addresses are, how bad was the accident from the start? What radiation was released into the environment? Should an evacuation have been ordered, and if so, when? The following audio of Arnie is taken from a video on fairwinds.com entitled, Three Myths of Three Mile Island. Be aware that there is music in the background coming from a marching band that was playing in the lobby of the hotel when this symposium took place. Around 7 o'clock in the morning, an engineer and his supervisor, using an approved procedure, calculated that the exposure in Goldsboro might be as high as 10 R an hour. Now, it was an approved procedure, and people had worked on it for years, and it was actually a TMI Unit 1 procedure, so this is not a, a new procedure. And by the procedure, an evacuation was required. There's no doubt that by the, the written process that people not in a crisis situation had available to them, by 7, 7.30 in the morning, an evacuation was required. At 7.30, TMI called the state and told them they had 10 R an hour. But TMI's position was that it seemed too conservative. They said the pressure wasn't high enough. Well, within the calculation, there was no pressure dependency. So basically, they went outside the realm in a crisis situation as opposed to letting the procedure govern how you should be working your way through. What they did not tell the state in that 730 phone call is that employees working outside had already begun to receive exposures. There's, uh, there's at least one case of an exposure of 20 mil around to an employee who was out on the grounds before 7.30 in the morning. They did not tell the state that already almost every radiation detector in the plant was off scale. According to Arnie Gunderson, a helicopter flew to Goldsboro, directly west of the Three Mile Island plant, at about 7.30 in the morning and reported that it found no radiation. But there are problems with that evaluation. It was a very calm day, and the helicopter actually got to Goldsboro before a plume would have gotten there. So had radiation been coming, the plume would have been very narrowly focused. If the helicopter were off by as little as 6 degrees meaning not directly in the center of the plume, the readings could have been off by a factor of 10,000 in the dose recorded. Finally, the helicopter actually arrived on site at 8.30 in the morning, not at 7.30 as was initially reported. Around this time, in the control room of the reactor, frightened engineers and plant operators tried to figure out what to do. What follows is a recording from a dictaphone that was either accidentally or intentionally left on and recorded what the people we count on in a nuclear accident sound like as they try to figure out what to do. The sound quality is not good, but listen closely as they discuss the problem and briefly consider the possibility of evacuation. almost totally 
in the blind. And it was on that basis that they decided not to call an evacuation. Mary Stamos is a longtime resident of Middletown, Pennsylvania. She lived and still lives only six and a half air miles from the facility and was directly in the center of the trajectory of the plume, though she did not know it at the time. I went into the driveway, and it was really strange because the air was filled with metal, and I didn't know if I was breathing it or tasting it, but I just looked around, and I couldn't figure out what, what was going on. And the thing that was really strange, it was a beautiful, sunny morning, and there were no birds when the birds were chirping all over the place the day before. And I just wondered, you know, what was going on, but I had no clue. While Mary Stamos had no clue, neither did the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Peter Bradford was an NRC commissioner at the time and had previously worked closely with Ralph Nader. Here are his recollections of that morning from inside the NRC. On the morning of the 28th of March, the commissioners received some level of notification, and I don't remember now just what level it was, but it was not a dramatic notification, simply that something unusual had happened at the plant. If I'm remembering correctly, it was a form of notification that we probably got five or six times a year with regard to events at nuclear plants. It was an indication that something out of the ordinary had happened, but it gave no hint of the severity of the uh, events at Three Mile Island. Arnie Gunderson pointed to a second window of opportunity for an evacuation to be ordered between 10 and 11 in the morning. The next time I suggest would be a, a good time to have evacuated is around 10 o'clock in the morning, between 10 and 11. By then, they knew that core thermal couples, that's a device to measure temperature inside the core, were measuring 2100 degrees. Well, normally they measure about 500 degrees. And 2100 degrees indicates that the fuel rods are entering something called a zerk water reaction. Fuel rods are made of zirconium and they scavenge oxygen out of H2O. So the oxygen gets pulled out of the H2O, releasing hydrogen. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, they knew that there was hydrogen being generated. There was not enough pooling or no pooling going through the core. Also by 10 o'clock, they had reactive cooling pumps, which are massive, uh, three, 4,000 horsepower pumps. And the uh, amperage for those pumps was very low. And that's an indication that they're not pumping water. It's an indication they're pumping steam or air. And the next thing is that in a, in a pressurized water reactor, they have neutron monitors in the core, but they have neutron monitors outside of the nuclear reactor. And the neutron monitors outside of the nuclear reactor were reading very high levels of neutrons. But what that means is that there was no water to moderate the neutrons. Even if the reaction was shut down, there were still more neutrons than they had ever experienced outside the core. And that's an indication that the core had lost its water and was, um, and was uncovered. Again, around 10 o'clock, the radiation monitors in the dome of the containment were at lethal levels, thousands of R an hour. Again, an indication that fuel is breaking down. And around 10 o'clock in the morning, Health Physics asked the plant management to evacuate the auxiliary building. So all these things were happening, and yet the state wasn't told that things were really out of control. The state wasn't told, the NRC wasn't told, and we the people were not told. The plant manager at Three Mile Island at the time was a man named Denny Miller. Arnie relayed what Miller had to say over the next few years about what was going on in that time frame. Note that everything he says as a quote, he has substantiated with footnotes in a report that is up on TMIA, the Three Mile Island Alerts website. The plant matter at the time was a guy named Miller. And here's what he had to say over the next couple years about what was going on in that time frame. They were hot enough that they scared you. And he was talking about the in-core temperature. Well, if you're scared, one would think that an evacuation might be in order. Pretty early, we were scared. Radiation was all over the place. Everything was off scale. 
another indication. If you're scared, it's about time to at least tell the civilians that it's time to, time to move out. And finally, we were not in our minds convinced that the Corps was totally covered. That's another indication that it's time to, to let the civilians know to, to head for the hills. And it didn't happen. This was uh, uh, another interesting quote. We don't know where the hell the plant was going. Now, Miller said that in a phone call to Parsippany. Parsippany was the headquarters office at 7.30 in the morning. And it was pretty clear in my mind that Miller was suggesting we should go to a general emergency. And the people in Parsippany talked him down to a site emergency. He changed his tune. We will have an interesting footnote on site manager Denny Miller at the end of this special report. What was going on in the outside world while all this was happening inside Three Mile Island? Arnie Gunderson reports on an email he received about one year ago. Since I've been talking about Fukushima, I got an a email that brought me to tears. It was a, a woman who was in 10th grade at the time of the accident, and she was in chemistry, and they were studying radiation, and they had a Geiger counter hanging out the window for the entire semester. They walk into the class at 10 o'clock on the morning of the accident, and the Geiger counter is pegged. So the teacher goes to the phone as a responsible citizen. He calls Governor Thornburg and tells him, look, I'm in Middleburg. I've got a pegged Geiger counter here. What should I do? And Governor Thornburg's office told this high school teacher, don't do anything. We know all about it. So they kept the kids in school. And, and who got evacuated were the kids, some people who worked at the power plant. They all came by and grabbed their kids and got out of there. But the kids that didn't have the inside scoop wound up staying in Middletown and got high exposure. At about this same time, Mary Stamos received first word that there was a real problem down at the end plant. Around 10.30 the morning of the accident, I got a phone call from my sister-in-law, and she worked for an environmental group, and there were attorneys there that were members of Three Mile Island Alert, and she said they told her that something had happened at Three Mile Island. The plant was shut down. They had some type of an accident. So I heard about it hours later after the metallic taste. I thought I was far enough away that it wouldn't be a problem. At 12.20, the NRC called TMI and asked, what is the temperature in the core? TMI got back to them shortly thereafter, and they said, we don't know. The computer is printing question marks. They said, that means that the computer is messed up. In fact, question marks meant that the temperature in the core was over 700 degrees. They did not know how high, but they knew it was high. And that was another indication of a meltdown in progress. A couple of minutes before two, there was a hydrogen explosion. Now, the industry will call it a hydrogen burn, but it was a hydrogen explosion. This from a newscast at the time. It roared uh, with a, uh, a tremendous uh, roar of releasing steam. It woke me up, uh, and uh, I looked out the window, and I saw this uh, huge column going up in the air and roaring. The NRC was not informed of this explosion until two days later. The following is transcribed from Arnie Gunderson's presentation, Three Myths of Three Mile Island. He said... Plant manager Miller was in the control room at the time based on affidavits from four reactor operators. They all said Miller knew about it. The control room shook. Now, when your building starts shaking, I think that is about the last indication you need that you really should let the civilians know to head for the hills. After that, it was unconscionable that an evacuation was not ordered on that first day. Of course, the official response from Three Mile Island and other industry officials was typical. Everything is under control. There is and was no danger to public health and safety. There was a small release of radiation to the environment. All safety equipment functioned properly. Metropolitan Edison has been monitoring the air in the vicinity of the plant constantly since the incident. No increase in normal radiation levels has been detected. The situation is more complex than the company first led us to believe. We are taking more tests, and at this point we believe there is still no danger to the public health. Uh, we have absolutely no question about the safety of nuclear plants as a result of this mishap. We do not refer to 
it as a nuclear accident because it was not that. And uh, as I say, all these systems went into operation as they should have. So when is a nuclear accident not a nuclear accident? Apparently, when the nuclear industry says so. None of the tumult going on within Three Mile Island, none of the damage, none of the information that Arnie Gunderson presented on the 30th anniversary of the accident was known to the outside world at that time. Mary Stamos. The evening news had Walter Cronkite on, and I missed all of what he said, but I had heard shortly after that that they were talking about this nuclear accident at Three Mile Island. And then the next morning, my neighbor worked at the hotel near me, and she would come by for coffee, and we'd sit and talk. And she told me on Thursday morning, the second day of the accident, I mean, this is like 6 a.m. in the morning, that reporters were calling from all over the world to make reservations to stay at the hotel because of the accident. And, you know, we weren't told it was anything serious. The evening newspaper on March 28th said low levels of radiation escape after end plant reactor pump fails. Leak poses no danger to the populace. Later in the afternoon, Thursday afternoon, the lieutenant governor goes on television and says that the accident at Three Mile Island told us that there'd be no problem. They would be able to restart in a couple of days. And then later, he comes back on television, like within an hour or so, and he says, we've been misled, we've been lied to, the nuclear accident is more severe than we have been led to believe, we were told to close our doors and windows. When I heard that... That's when I got really scared because I had heard from bomb fallout victims, you know, the history and the story of Utah and Nevada and other nuclear places where they're told to close their doors and windows. If nothing is happening, you can breathe the air, but they told us to close our doors and windows, and that was Thursday afternoon, and I started to really get worried. On the other hand, I wasn't worried at all. That's because I continued to ignore the media, dismissing the little bit I'd heard as an overblown media response to that little problem down at the end plant. Of course, it did not stop me from declaring myself as a member of that self-same media because I was a freelancer close to a big story and I wanted to capitalize upon it. The second day of the accident, as the reactor invisibly leaked radioactivity into the environment, I walked over a mile into Middletown, breathing deeply of the Pennsylvania springtime air, completely ignorant of the possible danger to which I was exposing myself. I stood around outside interviewing people, waited half an hour on a corner for a bus, then met up with my friend in Harrisburg for dinner. Over a carafe of wine, she told me half the people in her office had already left, and weren't they overreacting? I agreed. And then the two of us made our way back to the house, walking back from the bus stop. The third day of the accident, Friday, March 30th, I was alone in the house working on a musical, coincidentally entitled Armageddon, when I heard a bullhorn going down the street in front of the house, issuing the same warning as was heard at Fukushima. Stay indoors, close your doors and windows, and do not go outside unless you absolutely have to. Here's why. It began at 6.40 this morning and lasted until 9 o'clock. Another unexpected and substantial release of radiation into the atmosphere from reactor number 2. It produced a huge cloud of radioactive xenon gas and radiation levels 10 times the amount considered safe for the general public to be exposed to in a full year. The new information is this. The accident sent ionized radiation beaming through the plant's four-foot-thick walls. Consequently, the metal shield that protects the nuclear fuel may have been damaged. Suddenly, everything I had been made afraid of during the Cold War as coming from the Russians was threatening my life from just one mile away, courtesy my own government. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. For all I knew, 
The radiation level was so high that, in effect, I was already dead. Former NRC Commissioner Peter Bradford. The commission did not become aware of the seriousness of the event until Friday morning when we learned that there had been radiation measured by a helicopter flying over the plant site. And no one seemed to have a good explanation of what the source of that radiation was, whether it was likely to get worse, whether there were likely to be other releases. So for the first time, the commission had to focus on both notifying the rest of the federal government and formulating a recommendation for the governor of Pennsylvania as to what, if any, level of evacuation he should order. You know, I don't remember much about the debate among the commissioners. I know the consensus that we reached was to recommend the evacuation of pregnant women and children under the age of five from within a five-mile radius. Outside Three Mile Island, all was bedlam and chaos. But at least the world's reporters were on the job. What's it been like here uh, since Wednesday? Conflicting statements from the governor's office, the NRC here, the NRC in Washington, and the company Metropolitan Edison that owns the plant. There's been a severe communication problem uh, getting information back to Washington. I was there. I think we're very close to a, a chaotic situation. Part of it, I think, is a lack of credibility of what we're being told. Part of it's the confusion that's coming forth. I think it's inexcusable that we leave a private utility in full command of the situation. Uh, being advised and pulled and tugged and fragmented by the structure there. How can you say it's not an accident when radiation is being detected as far away as 16 miles? The accident did not occur inside uh, the reactor in the slightest. It was a, uh, a feed pump uh, connected to the turbine outside of the reactor area. Now that was a failure of a piece of machinery and therefore it was an accident of a with regard to it wasn't an accident, it was just a failure of a piece of machinery. There's also a bubble in the reactor vessel that means there any change and the hydraulics of the core have to be carefully monitored. So we're looking very carefully at the way the applicant intends to get the core to a cold shutdown condition. Uh, there's no relationship between that and what is thought of as a nuclear accident. One of the more bald faced examples of nuclear double talk and obfuscation. Middletown resident Mary Stamos. The next morning, around 8.30 or 9.30, all of a sudden, I heard sirens ringing and the church bells were ringing, which I never heard like this, and all of the sirens were ringing in this area. And I turned the TV on. I didn't see anything. And then I turned my radio on, and I hear the newscaster, Ron Drake, talking about having uncontrolled radiation releases from Three Mile Island. And that's when I really started to panic. And a little bit later, the one person, I don't know who it was, that we consider him a hero, he turned the sirens on in Harrisburg, and the people started to panic, and they were hearing all the news about what was happening. And then the governor, Thornburg, was kind of forced into talking about radiation, you know, and the exposure that people might be getting. Based on advice of the chairman of the NRC, and in the interest of taking every precaution, I am advising those who may be particularly susceptible to the effects of any radiation, that is, pregnant women and preschool-age children, to leave the area within a five-mile radius of the three-mile island facility until further notice. And, and like I said, I'm six and a half miles away, but I was still worried. The whole idea of being able to evacuate the communities that size is absurd. It's been absurd all along, and it's just governmental and utility nonsense to talk about being able to cope with a situation by evacuation because you're never going to get the people out. We are advising the people on the basis of information, on the basis of a recommendation from the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that they simply ought to stay indoors as a precautionary measure, you know, until they hear from word from it. Yeah, that simple. Yeah, a lot of people are leaving the Harrisburg area right now. Uh, my own family's on the way to New York City right now to stay with relatives. Uh, a lot of people 
closed, the gas stations were flooded, the banks were busy, people were throwing some of their money so they could get out of here. I didn't have a car that morning, so I talked to my neighbor, and she said that um, we could go to her mother's house. So I got my son ready, I went to school to get my daughter out of school, and her teacher was really upset because she had children that she couldn't go get until all her children from the school were leaving. So when we got to the school, got my daughter, and then we went to my friend's mother's home, That was about 10 miles. And then my husband was still out of town. He worked at a telephone company, and when he tried to call, he couldn't even get through. The the phone lines were so jammed. I had the exact same problem trying to call out. There was this weird siren sound on the line that wouldn't let me get through. Oh, wow. My friends finally did get through to me on the phone. They picked me up and we evacuated to a friend of theirs who lived 150 miles away, which we hoped was far enough. I stayed there for the next 10 days and then flew out, away from Harrisburg, away from Middletown, away from Three Mile Island. So I missed having a community of people who together were able to process what had happened to them, commiserate with each other, and get angry in a legal way at the powers that be at Three Mile Island. I also missed the worst of the follow-up information. Mary Stamos. When I got my daughter ready to go back to school the one morning, um, I was brushing her hair, and she had thick, lovely hair, blondish, and uh, a whole lot of hair came out in the hairbrush, and it kind of freaked me out. I gave my son a little bath, and I saw a whole wad of hair in the tub, which I never had experienced before. And when I looked at his scalp, I could see his scalp, and it wasn't solid hair. And I didn't think a whole lot of it because I thought when radiation caused hair fallout, I thought you would be bald. I didn't know until a couple years later that you could just have a certain degree of hair loss. I didn't know what was going to happen to us in the future if we'd all get cancer or whatever. Other post-Three Mile Island problems noticed and documented by Mary Stamos include a sudden growth spurt in some of her plants, as much as four inches in less than a week, mutated flowers branching out into multiples that did not previously exist in nature, a rose that grew out of the middle of another rose but with no reproductive components visible on either of them, and dandelion leaves that were three feet long. These are all evidence of a process known as fasciation, which are mutations in plant life following exposure to radiation. Fasciation has also been observed at Fukushima and Chernobyl. At Three Mile Island, animal mutations and animal deaths followed. There was a lady at one of the first meetings I ever attended, the public NRC meeting. She stood up and asked a question of the NRC, or MedEd, the Metropolitan Edison, the TMI owners. And she wanted to know when they were going to pay her for her losses of animals. And she had a dog kennel or a poodle kennel. And her poodles was born with no eyes. It had eye sockets but no eyes, and she lived right down across the street from Three Mile Island. They paid her every penny that she asked for, but she was not allowed to talk about it. Mary Stamos became and remains involved with Three Mile Island Alert. In the wake of the accident, learning that there was no epidemiological follow-up to determine the impact of the accident on the health of local residents, she and others from the group went door-to-door in the evacuation area, asking questions about people's health. She was shocked to learn that more than 50% of the people who lived within a five-mile radius of the nuclear reactors at Three Mile Island had moved away within the past five years, though one can hardly blame them. One final story from Mary. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Three Mile Island would come and have all these meetings and people would talk about their problems and they kept insisting that radiation wasn't the cause, but they never once said what it would have been. They blamed the health department here and the government, blamed a lot of it on stress 
I mean, I never had metallic taste before, but I had stress before. I've never heard of an animal mutating because of stress. As for the legal follow-up, citizens succeeded in a class action suit against Three Mile Island, winning $25 million in an out-of-court settlement. Part of this money was used to create the TMI Public Health Fund. In 1983, a federal grand jury indicted the public utility, Metropolitan Edison, on criminal charges for the falsification of safety tests prior to the accident. But under a plea bargaining agreement, MetEd pleaded guilty to one count of falsifying records and no contest to six other charges, four of which were subsequently dropped. They agreed to pay a $45,000 fine and set up a $1 million account to help with emergency planning in the area surrounding the nuclear reactors. Note that $1 million is approximately the profit on one nuclear reactor operating for one day. So it seems that MetEd got off very cheaply. We'll have an interview with Eric Epstein of Three Mile Island Alert, who brings us up to date on what has happened in the last 37 years since the accident began. But first, a reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat is listener-supported and relies on your donations to help us keep going and growing. If you appreciate the kind of honest and vetted nuclear information represented by this program and want to help keep making it available, please do what you can to help us. You can start with what we call the Starbucks donation of the equivalent of a cup of coffee. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer is deeply appreciated, and you have my ongoing gratitude. To find out more about what occurred in the aftermath of Three Mile Island, I spoke with Eric Epstein, who has been with Three Mile Island Alert for more than 30 years. Eric knows where the metaphoric bodies are buried and was happy to share his knowledge for the Nuclear Hot Seat audience. Eric Epstein, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. First of all, tell us, what is Three Mile Island Alert and when was it formed? Three Mile Island Alert is a safe energy organization that was founded in 1977 in response to the uh, construction of Three Mile Island Unit 2, which was a plant involved with the core meltdown in 1979. So we've been around for a significant period of time, almost 40 years. The uh, beginning was rocky. Most people had supported nuclear power vigorously in this country in response to to uh, Arab oil embargo, stagflation, and, and a number of reasons. I think people felt nuclear was the answer, but nobody was asking any questions, and that's what we did. Since that time, we have now uh, grown. We cover eight counties. We cover three nuclear power plants, obviously Three Mile Island, Unit 1, which is operating, Three Mile Island Unit 2, which is not cleaned up, Peach Bottom 1, 2, and 3, and Susquehanna 1 and 2. So we've morphed into a uh, safe energy group, a nuclear watchdog, and a voice for the community. How long have you been involved with the group, and what was your involvement at the time that the accident happened? That's a good question. At the time the accident happened, ironically, I was in Los Angeles in college working with a group known as the Alliance for Survival opposing San Onofre. I was involved beginning in 1982 with the Susquehanna Valley Alliance, which was primarily concerned with preventing the dumping of radioactive water, about 700,000 gallons, into the Susquehanna River. And from 1984 until the current time, I've either been the chairperson or the spokesperson for TMI Alert consistently. So uh, I didn't <laughs> I didn't know at the time that I was signing up for a, a lifetime commitment, but I'm proud to do it, and I think it's important that our community has continuity and monitors the nuclear power plants in our backyards. We're here 24-7, 365, and as you know, we created a radiation monitoring network. Uh, we've also partnered with Dickinson College to create an archives, and our project for the 35th anniversary of TMI contains some real moving graphic and poignant interviews with folks that survived the accident. I find it highly ironic that you who lived in the area were in California, and I who lived in California was at Three Mile Island when it happened. There's some karmic interchange happening there. 
just, you know, to be honest, it was quite an evolution for me growing up. You know, we welcomed TMI. I swam there. You know, people fished there. The jobs were good. Nobody really questioned it, which was a huge mistake. My dad reassured me that it was a safe source of energy. So, you know, the tables turned dramatically on March 28, 1979, when the accident began. And look, my family didn't respond in a universal way. My dad evacuated, left the area, actually went to Delaware, which wasn't really that far away. My sister was in school and was one of the last kids to be picked up because we didn't really have a plan in place. So a lot of those kids dealt with that terror of not knowing if or when they'd be picked up. My family store stayed open. We had survived three floods, and we thought, hell, we could survive a nuclear accident. But people need to remember that the accident began on March 28th with a core melt, and by March 30th, Friday, kids were in school. It was warm, and that's when the precautionary evacuation took place. So it was indeed ironic that I was in Los Angeles, actually Anaheim at the time, and there's nothing like a nuclear meltdown to enhance your credibility. During the media circus that surrounded the accident's aftermath, What were some of the lies and distortions told by those in power, including MedEd? Right out of the bat, MedEd tried to downplay the accident, and that's been a problem at every marquee nuclear accident, whether it's TMI, Chernobyl, or Fukushima, that the people that caused the accident are responsible for the chain of communication. So if you look at the records and the Udall report, you'll find out real early on that the governor, who was just brand new, Governor Thornburg had just been elected and didn't know where TMI was, and TMI is 12 miles away from the Capitol, quickly lost faith in the company. And there there was a dramatic press conference given by the lieutenant governor, I think, on March 29th, basically saying that, you know, we cannot believe the information we're getting from the company. The second myth that is probably more prevalent and troubling is that nobody died as a result of the accident. Conservatives and pro-nuclear people used to say that Ted Kennedy's car killed more people than the accident at TMI. And the problem is so much radiation escaped. And if you want to see estimates, I'd encourage people to check out Dr. Jan B.A. or David Lockbaum. Jan B.A. is with the Audubon Society and David Lockbaum is with the Union of Concerned Scientists. And we don't know how much radiation escaped. Why? Because the monitors weren't equipped to pick up the amount that was released. Monitors went off stack. Filters became clogged. Monitors were missing. So we had to go back and do an inventory of radiation released. And what we found, and I think the most definitive health study, was done by Dr. Wing. If you look at the 17 WIM plume pathways and you look at the cancer incidents, you will find that TMI had a devastating impact in the community, both in terms of physical health and psychological health. And up until this day, The company's paid out over $100 million in claims for evacuation, economics, health damages, including $1 million award to a family whose child was born with Down syndrome. You know, it's pretty clear that we live with chronic elevated psychological stress. The evidence is overwhelming that we were exposed to radiation. Look, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of accounts. What were some of the early indicators that the health of local residents was being negatively affected by the Three Mile Island accident? Well, unfortunately, since the radiation monitors didn't work or were missing, human beings became essentially the barometer for the amount of radiation that was exposed. So we became human decimeters, and what people experienced was universal, uh, metallic taste in the mouth, sunburn, skin, eye irritation, vomiting, diarrhea, all effects of being exposed to radiation. It had a dreadful effect on animals, as most veterinarians in the area testified to. So it was pretty early on that the canary and the coal mine was both animals and human beings, which is absolutely unacceptable. And as time has gone on, and we're 37 years out now, um, we see an exceptionally high rate of thyroid cancer. Penn State at Hershey is still investigating those effects. Unfortunately, the state has given up and the federal government has kicked in the towel. And as we have complained, Libby, for 37 years, still no nuclear power plant has a health registry or a cancer registry for workers or people who live in the community. And that is unconscionable. You referenced a health study. How long after the accident did health studies begin? And what were some of the problems that researchers faced? The problem was that you have a mobile population here to begin with. It's the capital. So one segment of the population changes every four to eight years, depending on who's governor. And the other segment of the population is extremely stable. You know, you have people whose heritage dates back to the Revolutionary War. This is Bible Belt, Christian conservative America. And these people 
who are also bedrock community are the people who went from being pro-nuclear to being skeptical to being thoroughly fed up with the industry. I'm telling you that because the surveys that happened and a definitive study that the industry relies on was done in 1985. 1985, just six years after the accident, no scientist in their right mind would tell you that you can capture radiogenic cancer in six years. That's junk science. Even that study, which was conducted by Dr. Tokihata from the Department of Health, was dismissed by epidemiologists at Penn State and at Harvard. And that wasn't even a study. It was a survey. And that's why I was complaining before about residents not being interviewed, is that they didn't even interview people. They basically did a survey of the area. The lines were fudged. The survey was thrown out. And really, the definitive health account occurred in the early 1990s by uh, Dr. Stephen Wing from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And if you reference that, you can see exactly what we argued since the day of the accident. Follow the plumes. Talk to the people, and what you will find is high incidence of radiogenic cancer. And we still have cancer to this day, not to mention the fear of the unknown. People don't know what they were exposed to. Some people made decisions not to raise a family because they didn't want to bequeath mutations. And so it's an accident without an end. Libby, it's what I told people before. I can tell you the exact time the accident began, March 28, 1979, 358. I can't tell you what time it ends because nuclear accidents never end. This is a story where the pallbearers are going to have to stand in place forever. What if any action has been taken against MedEd or any other organization that was involved, Babcock and Wilcox, any of the creators of Three Mile Island? Well, everybody sued each other. Nobody took responsibility. It's the old story. The company sued the NRC. That was thrown out. The Babcock and Wilcox suit was settled out of court. The company that owned the plant was actually a a holding company. It was GPU. MedEd, who was the operator, owned 50% of the plant. 25% was owned by Jersey Central Power and Light, and 25% was owned by Penelec. Just the cruel irony of this is that we really didn't get any electricity from that nuclear power plant. Jersey Central and Power and Light is in New Jersey. We live in central Pennsylvania. Penelec is in Allentown. We live in central Pennsylvania. Penelec is in western Pennsylvania. We live in central Pennsylvania. So the people that had to deal with the accident really never received any of the benefits. Now, there was a fine and there were criminal convictions. The company no longer exists, and the plant has been sold multiple times since the accident. So essentially, the company not only got away scot-free, but they were bailed out by taxpayers and by the federal government for the defueling. You asked me earlier what was one of the biggest myths. The third biggest myth and probably biggest lie is that TMI-2 was cleaned up. At the time of the accident, there was no decommissioning funds. They had no money. They operated for one 120th of their lifespan cost a billion to build, a billion to defuel, and it'll cost another billion to decommission, and they just don't have enough money. I mean, the the reality is that TMI-2 will never be cleaned up, and this is an accident without an ending. So here we are 37 years later. What current actions are taking place regarding Three Mile Island, and what, if anything, can listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat do to help support you in your work? Well, you know, you can visit our websites, obviously, you know, donations help. But if you go to the TMIA website, TMIA.com, you'll see that we track three nuclear power plants on a daily basis. We have a record of every incident or problem that's occurred at all three plants, everything since the day they began to up till today. That's for Susquehanna, Peach Bottom, and TMI. We established a radiation monitoring network, and you can go to EFMR.org, and you can find – what we promise to give the community has come to fruition, and that's real-time radiation monitoring. We've also distributed 50,000 KI tablets, and we'll continue to provide that service to the community. So you can support us by staying in touch, TMIA for what we do at the nuclear power plants, EFMR for the radiation monitoring. Go to the Dickinson archives, and we have voluminous records there, including oral histories from year zero and year 25. I think people will find the uh, 35th year project really moving. It's really a graphic novel with interviews from survivors. So what people can do is basically make sure it doesn't happen to them. Stay active. Ask questions. Don't be a victim. You don't have to be a passive victim. You can be the aggressor. And I think what we found is something totally ironic. 37 years later, alternatives and renewals have supplanted nuclear power. 
they could leave the community tomorrow and it would have a minimal economic impact. They've gone from 804 people working at TMI-1 to 525. They've gone from 1,100 people working at TMI-2 to zero, zero. TMI-2 pays no taxes. So what used to be their ace in the hole is gone. Alternatives and renewables have arrived. The economic impact has diminished. And just by staying the course, and I think you and your listeners have probably know this for years, that you know the only thing that matters in this country that's green is money, and nobody in their right mind would invest in a nuclear power plant these days. I understand that some people may seem disaffected by nuclear power, but it affects everybody. If you just look at how nuclear power works from the moment it's mined, milled, transported, split, and then turns into waste, everybody, no matter where you are, you're impacted. So be aware that at some point in time, you're touched by nuclear power production. Eric Epstein, thank you so much for all your years of dedicated work with TMI Alert, and thank you for being my guest on this very special nuclear hot seat. I appreciate your diligence, Libby, and your stick to and your tenaciousness, and people need to understand that what you're doing is hard and it's difficult. So people tuning into Hot Seat could also, you know, send you some thank yous or some kudos. I'm, that's what I'm doing from Harrisburg today, and I appreciate all your efforts on everybody's behalf. That was Eric Epstein of Three Mile Island Alert. We will have links up to TMIA.com, as well as the other websites and articles and studies that Eric mentioned under this week's episode number 249. Here's today's final thought. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima. What was never supposed to happen has now happened three times. Five, if you count Fukushima's three core meltdowns as individual incidents. Five major nuclear reactor accidents, creating radiation releases with impact and implications on health and safety that will last for more generations than we can imagine, or maybe even more than we as a species still have. But these headline accidents are not the only problems, as regular listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat know. Right now... The nuclear reactors at Indian Point in New York, only 35 miles from midtown Manhattan, are leaking radioactive tritium into groundwater at levels 650 times higher than the maximum that's permitted. Florida's Turkey Point reactors are leaking radioactive water into Biscayne Bay, polluting Miami's drinking water with radionuclides. On India's west coast, on the Indian Ocean... The Kakrapur nuclear reactor in Gujarat has been leaking radiation for three weeks and counting. And Fukushima is the disaster that will never end, continually leaking radioactivity into the Pacific Ocean and the air, all of it being made worse by the Japanese government's idiocy in handling the nuclear waste, as well as their never-ending lies about radioactivity's risks to its citizens. Thirty-seven years ago, the Three Mile Island accident and the honest media coverage that it created prompted an international resistance to nuclear that stopped the industry dead in its tracks, but unfortunately did not kill it outright. Pro-nuclear forces and lobbyists spent the time since then putting millions of dollars into public relations to manufacture our consent rejuvenating their image and massaging talking points. They have succeeded in convincing much of the world that nukes are really clean, green, sustainable, and necessary, none of which is true. Yes, it's a depressing picture, but we may right now have another moment of opportunity. In the wake of the Brussels terrorist attacks of March 22nd and the revelation that Belgium's Tehange nuclear reactors were the terrorists' first intended target, the world is now looking at nuclear reactors from a very different perspective. Clearly, the threat posed by radiation releases and long-term health compromises don't get governmental and economic juices flowing. But the suddenly perceived threat of the dirty bomb in the backyard represented by every reactor and every spent fuel pool in existence, has provided an unavoidable international nuclear wake-up call. Now it's up to us. 
to keep pushing. Whatever your chosen activism is, keep doing it. Keep the information real. Don't exaggerate because the facts alone are bad enough. But whatever you do, don't stop. Let's get these things shut down, put out of their misery for good, and then figure out what in the world we're going to do with all of that toxic, deadly waste. We succeeded in slowing them down once after Three Mile Island. Now let's get them out of commission for good. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, March 28, 2016. Material for the Three Mile Island Anniversary Special was researched and compiled from Fairwinds Energy Education at fairwinds.org with gratitude to Arnie Gunderson, Eric Epstein of TMI Alert, TMI Alert member Mary Stamos, former Nuclear Regulatory Commissioner Peter Bradford, and the strong, good-looking, and above-average members of the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to join. A reminder also that on my website, NuclearHotSeat.com, you can sign up for a free chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, that deals with what it was like on the ground at Three Mile Island as it was happening. It will also put you on our email list so that you will get Nuclear Hot Seat delivered to your inbox every week. The music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, NewZSentinel.com, and StuWebRadioNetwork.com. We're always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know a news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, do put us in touch. I'm also open to John Oliver, Samantha B., Stephen Colbert, and Trevor Noah. You can check out our archive of over 245 shows on the website NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. And remember, it's your contributions that help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for accurate, honest nuclear news with an attitude. So please... Donate what you can by going to NuclearHotSeat.com and clicking on the big red Donate button. Speaking of attitude, I was going to include my song from the show Armageddon, the one that I was writing when I was in evacuation at Three Mile Island, called Only One Mile from Three Mile Island. But there's no time on the show today, so it's going to be posted up on the website as a separate download. About three minutes, I'm the one singing... And it will show you quite clearly that I've been of this frame of mind for a long time, considering that I wrote the song 37 years ago. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Same for all you media guys and gals. Call me. I'm a source for your stories. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that from Three Mile Island to Chernobyl to Fukushima, we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So do not Go back to sleep, because truly, we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.